All right, and you are spotlit and it's starting up. All right. Give it a minute and we're good. Cool. How's everybody doing? It's beautiful in Boston, I think. From the, from the window, it's beautiful. Um, okay, so, so we had a good week of learning about acrobats and cart poles and quad rotors and Peruta pendulums and all that, right? These are the canonical underactuated systems. And I wanted to give you a window into the way people did it, you know, kind of before we had um, optimal control and RL and everything like that. Let me just walk you through it. But I want to spend today. Um, so my, my, my idea here is that I want to just like land one key I, new idea or connection idea, add a little something in each of these little um, mini lectures. So I'm going to try to tell you how it relates to some of the things we see in RL with the same kind of systems. Okay, but just to sort of recap the week here, these were the canonical underactuated systems. We spent the most time on Acrobat, Cartpole, and Quadrotor, um, like examples and stuff, and even Ballbot, I guess. Um, but there are many more. We had one lecture showing that actually LQR does pretty well, even though these systems are nonlinear and underactuated, the linearization is still pretty good, and LQR um, works pretty well, but with an important limitation, right? It works in the vicinity, it stabilizes these fixed points um, as long as the, the, the system is controllable, okay? But it doesn't, it has a limited domain of, of viability, and you know that from our previous lectures that we think of that as the region of attraction of the fixed point when the system has a closed loop control, has this LQR controller, you know, it has a, has a reasonable region of attraction. It will stabilize that fixed point, but not from the entire, not from every state. So you have to be pretty close to the upright to turn on the LQR controller for the Acrobat, a little bit farther from the Acrobat, from the upright for the cart pole, you know, and, but LQR does a pretty good job. And then for the rest of the state space, we had to go to a more nonlinear control approach. So the linearization wasn't um, enough to stabilize the whole system. We started thinking about the nonlinear dynamics directly. And to some extent, we did the pencil and paper approach where we looked, wrote down the equations of motion and we tried to think about, use our mechanical intuition about energy, for instance, and started to write down equations where we could find a Lyapunov function or find some sort of argument play a little trick with algebra. I've always thought that thought of that as only really a trick where you're like, oh, I've got a cosine, I'll multiply it by cosine, I get a cosine squared. That's, you know, sort of a good trick. But it is definitely the case um, that, that these are fairly system specific tricks. You know, multiplying by cosine worked for this system, you got a different system, you might need a slightly different trick to make it positive. You get to have a, a few recipes, but, um, uh, but in general, you, if you found a way to stabilize a new system, you had a new research paper, right? It was kind of like each, each, each one required a little different uh, amount of work. Feedback linearization was the, one of the general ideas that popped out of that, okay? That was that's a, one of the general approaches. I would say the, you know, making things uniformly negative by multiplying, that's kind of another one. It doesn't have a name, but that, that's a recipe that happens over and over. But people don't do that so much anymore, right? Now we're so into optimal control and reinforcement learning. And if you look, you, you probably, uh, if you've played with RL, you've probably made the connection already that actually, if you go to, for instance, the OpenAI gym benchmarks for RL, in fact, the first two, they call it classic control. Um, but the first two examples are, you know, Acrobat and Carpool. That is, uh, you know, that's a recent thing, and uh, but but that's cool. Uh, mountain car, there's a couple, there's only a few more, right? If you sort of scroll down, there's a, just the pendulum, in fact. We, we've pretty much got it covered if we just typed in the mountain car, right? Um, <clears throat> so, but I wanna be a little careful because um, even though people are applying RL to these systems, you have now leveled up in your understanding of these systems. And I wanna take your, understanding of, of, of how you control the cart pole and, and the acrobat and some of the subtleties there. And I wanna, let's say, scrutinize a little bit um, the, the way you see them used in RL. Okay, so uh, let's proceed. Well, first of all, 
since I haven't actually said it yet, and I, I mean, I had a good question of it in uh, of it in Gathertown the other day. You know, how how exactly is reinforcement learning related to the dynamic programming we've talked about? Now, these are all families of algorithms, heavy overlap, lots of notational similarities, you know, lots of historical similarities. I think the simplest way to think about it is that reinforcement learning it used to actually be commonly called ADP, adaptive dynamic uh, approximate dynamic programming. In fact, some of the main RL, the main RL con uh, uh, conference was ADP RL, I don't know, something like this, but, but it, ADP definitely in the name, right? So think of it as once we've given up having exact optimal control, we wanna do approximate optimal control. You know, that's, uh, that's a common um, phrasing of what RL is, which means that once we did the, even the barycentric interpolation in the value function, you might call that an RL algorithm. Uh, we've distinguished here between in this in the class so far, sort of talking about model-based RL. A lot of the things we're doing with model-based control in this class could be characterized as model-based RL. And there's a distinct part of RL, very important part of RL, which is if you how would you do control if you if you didn't even have the model, if you had no attempt to write down the model or, or even build an explicit forward model. Okay, so um, so Acrobat, if you if it were to head just on that open AI page, clicked on Acrobat, uh, then you get to this Acrobat V1 uh, description. And I wanna just take a minute to, to, to read this. So, so it includes two joints and two links. We know that. Um, the joint between the two links is actuated only, right? We know that. Initially, the links are hanging downwards and the goal is to swing the end of the lower link up to a given height. Okay, so um, that's already interesting, right? So the, you see that black line in the screen on the right, in the OpenAI benchmark, the task is only to get your hand above the line, right? Uh, it is not to balance at the top, which is interesting. I mean, the balancing at the top, although it was easy for LQR, is actually hard for RL. In fact, it's hard for value iteration. If we take the, if you took the algorithm that we've already given you for the pendulum and everything like this, uh, exactly the same code, you can write the four-dimensional version. It's it's easy to, to write. It's pretty easy to run. It's not. It gets. It is. There is a curse of dimensionality, but four is not a big enough dimension to kill it. You can just run that. Um, but you will find, even though it converges nicely on something and says it's happy. If you simulate that controller on the real system, it will not stabilize the top. That's okay. Okay, I can't, I can't say that. You could find a discretization that would stabilize the top, but I'm my my guess is my statement is that if you tried, your first experience would be that it would be hard to stabilize the top. Okay, and in fact, it takes even with a lot of trying, it is hard to stabilize the top. The system is actually pretty hard to control, and you the mesh you would need is non-trivial. And um, and and sort of surprisingly hard to get with a with a value iteration type algorithm. It's the first place where, um, you know, really the LQR really beats hands down beats uh, the value iteration type algorithms. People have done it for sure. Okay, but it's mu it's a much it's a, it's a much different task I'd say to just get your hand above the line. Uh, this is also a sparse reward task in the sense that you you only um, you only get a goal once your hand is there. So a lot of waving around doesn't get you anything. I think we're going to look at the cost function again to to be sure, um, which is which is hard. There's sort of um, in you know it's it's a weird cost function. Okay, so and, and I want to think about it with you. So I put in um, GitHub doesn't allow. I framing, but I copied the, the relevant part of that code into this um, window for you. And you can see that the equations look almost exactly like what I showed you in the, the Drake version. It's always, it's always funny. They, they tend to have like, um, I don't know, one paper headed like this way, another paper headed this way. I think the thing that always, that always trips people up is that there's, um, you can write the moment of inertia relative to the center of mass or the, I didn't scrutinize the differences here, but my, sus, my suspicion is that the two derivations you see out there, one of them has the center of mass is written around the, uh, the, the inertia is written about the center of mass of the links and the other one has it written around the joints, the parent joints. Um, that's typically the two equations of motion that appear. Um, they just put them both in, I guess. 
but it's basically looks exactly like, you know, very, very similar to what we've done. Uh, even the same kind of variable names, right? These are, the, these are propagated through the literature and they propagated their way into to my notes and they propagated their way into the OpenAI gym. Okay, so let's just think about what's, you know, how hard that task is, right? So, um, I mean, Mark Spong gave, I think we saw it the clearest in this sort of energy shaping control, uh, right? Where you could, there's actually a very, very simple controller that will accomplish this task, right? All you have to do is basically look at the, um, the velocity of your links and decide if, should I pump to the right or pump to the left? And, and basically there's one direction that will add energy into the system and there's one direction that will remove energy to the system. And that controller, you can write down, we, we, we scrutinized it for the simple pendulum, but the basic controller also works for the Acrobat. And there's like a one line, super simple controller that you could write that would get full points on the, on the Acrobat RL task, right? And it's, um, I think, surprisingly hard, hard to get it from, from the RL. I mean, it's certainly possible. It's still one of the intro examples, but compared to the, uh, you know, the number of characters it takes to write down the controller on a piece of paper, it's a, you know, throwing a deep neural network at it and trying and trying and trying is a pretty different approach, okay? Um, but what I wanna think about is even if we put in a deep neural network and we did lots and lots of trials, do we expect it to recover Mark Spong's controller, that simple controller? What do you think? I made the point in the lecture too, but one of the magical things about Mark Spong's controller and that energy shaping controller is it does not depend on the mass. It does not depend on, you know, uh, basic, you know, on the friction in the joints, anything like this, right? It just is incredibly insensitive and robust controller in terms of the, the parameters. There's no, there's no reason why the RL algorithm would try to find such a robust controller. You're asking it in this setup to stabilize a particular Acrobat, right? And um, if we don't model uh, sensor noise or, or if we don't model you know, uncertainty in our mass or uncertainty in the uh, friction parameters or anything like that, then many controllers could stabilize it. And some of them will be very sensitive to those parameters in a way that Mark Spong's controller wasn't. Right, that's an important thing. I, uh, I really, um, in the, it's. I think there is. We were talking the other day about the language of optimal control and writing objective functions as being sort of a different language to write um, to program your robots. Yeah. The challenge there is making sure you've put all of the things you actually want into your cost function, right? And if you don't explicitly say I want it to be robust to all the parameters of the robot, then there's no reason it will give you that. There's just, we haven't asked for it and, and it will find a solution that satisfies it, uh, that doesn't require that. You, whether Mark Spong was thinking about that when he wrote his controller, probably he was, right? But, but somehow it's a very different thing to say, well, I wrote a controller, it doesn't even use the mass, right? There's like no M in the equation I wrote down Therefore, it is immune to the, you know, and I can prove that for all masses, it still goes down, right? Then it is incre it's in incredibly robust to the, the mass parameter. Does that point land? Do you guys, you with me on that? Yeah. So um, there is an answer that you can, you, uh, in optimal control and reinforcement learning, right? You can explicitly ask, for the system to be robust to certain parameters, and people do that, and so the most common or the most uh, you know visible way to do that is called domain randomization. So when you're doing domain randomization for uh, a system that's used using in cameras, then it then it, you often see people like trying to change lighting parameters or texture maps or color um, you know 
color spaces or, or, or whatever to try to say, I'd like the same controller to work even if the lights are on, if the lights are off, if the bricks are blue or, or red or green. And, and if you ask, if basically every time the reinforcement learning algorithm tries to run the system, it gets a different lighting condition, then in order to solve the problem, it will try to, it will, that is one way to ask it to then work for many different robots. So if you were to, in the Acrobat example, make the mass a random variable, and every time it ran, it picked a different mass, then, then it would have a better chance of coming up with the, you know, the controller that is insensitive to mass. We know that controller exists. We would be optimistic that it could find it. And, um, you know, but it's a different question. And the hard part is, right, like how, how many things do you have to ask for? Okay, so I want it to be robust to mass. I want it to be robust to the friction parameters. I want it to be robust. And, and it, you know, maybe you forgot to add something, right? And there's something very beautiful about just having a one-line equation that just didn't depend on a bunch of stuff. And you know, right off, you know, you know that it doesn't depend on those things. And, um, and here, every time you add a little bit more to your objective function, the optimization problem gets more complicated. It gets harder to solve. And, um, and you may or may not have remembered to add everything. So that's, a, I mean, that's not a, uh, that's I think true of all optimal control. Reinforcement learning, the, the, the more op, the model-based optimal control we're talking about um, in the class, always, once you've changed your language from specifying, you know, the equations of the controller with your, with your intuition baked in to, um, you know, writing just the objective function, you have to play this game. You have to understand, make sure you're asking for the right objective. Okay, so let's see what they do for the cart pull. It's, um, the cart pull is sort of example two and here it's actually the opposite, right? So it's um, rather than doing the swing up only, this is doing sort of the balancing only. Uh, the pole is attached. You know what the carpool system is. The pendulum starts upright, and the goal is to prevent it from falling over. So a reward of plus one is provided for every time step that the pole remains upright. The episode ends when the pole is more than 15 degrees from vertical, or the cart moves more than 2.4 units, presumably meters, uh, from the center. Okay, so, um, so, so I think one of the great things about RL is that you can write down arbitrary cost functions and, and try to, to optimize against it. But in my view, that's a very sloppy cost function. <laughs> like, uh, like if you're thinking hard about the, the, um, the balancing control task or whatever, that is just a weird underspecified control function, right? And I think um, we, we, should, we should think about that a little bit together. So. Why do I say that? Uh, well, first of all, let me just say that if you look at the carpool code, again, it's um, you know very, very simple. It's typed in the same equations that we have in, in the notes, right? There's an, again a note about there was an error introduced in Barto or whatever. So, um, but it's pretty much exactly like what we've been working with. But what I want to sort of think with you about is, um, is that a reasonable cost function, right? It's a kind of a weird one. Hopefully this is good and working. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's even think about what that would look like for the double integrator where I can draw it on the screen here, right? So uh, imagine I have my double integrator, Q and Q dot. And now I have um, some, some region of bad this that happens here. This is like my Q max and Q min. My goal is to start in the middle and not, not ever leave into these. These are my, I stop getting a reward if I go over into those regions, right? And we know that there, in the double integrator, we know that there was um, this minimum time, you know, if, if this, controls are saturated at plus or minus one, which they are in this case. In fact, they're discrete in this case. It's only negative one, zero, or positive one in the open AI gym environment. Then <clears throat> certainly there's an important curve, which is sort of, uh, let me change colors here. There's an important curve up here 
which is the curve that if I'm up here and I say u equals positive one, then if I start in this state, this is sort of clearly the best I can do in those states is to hit the brakes as much as possible and try not to leave that region, right? If I'm in here, if I'm on the blue line, then I'll be successful. I can avoid, I can come to rest before I leave the, the region of where I'll stop getting reward, right? Similarly down here, there's a curve where if I go, I'm sorry, this one's probably u equals minus one. And this is u equals plus one, depending on, yeah, I think. Um, <clears throat> Right, so, so that's clearly the right thing to do over here. And since it's gonna give me a positive one reward until the moment that I leave, then it's perfectly, it's, it's completely clear that what I should do here is hit the brakes as much as possible. That will, I'll spend as much time as possible before I leave that into that red area, right? The question is, you know, what, what should I do when I'm in here? What's the optimal controller while you're in there? The answer is you can do anything you want. In the continuous time thing, it's completely unspecified, right? There's absolutely nothing to tell me I should do plus one, minus one, whatever. Do whatever the heck you want while you're in here, okay? As you move around the system, if I ever randomly do something that gets me at the moment, I would hit this important line that could, where I'm on the boundary of going out of the reward area. Then at that point, my controls become fully specified. I need to hit the brakes and make sure I don't go out. Okay. But in here, I can do whatever the heck I want. There's just nothing to tell me that one thing is better than uh, anything else. As a result, it's, it is a weird thing to optimize, right? It's, it's like, um, yeah, I think as, an, as a, certainly as an optimization objective or whatever, you, you tend to want to, um, to specify things completely as, so you're probably not, not only so you're not surprised, but the, the problems tend to be better, um, easier to solve, you know, more, more conditioned if there's kind of like a right answer. If there's, if there's arbitrariness in the specification, then the problem tends to get harder to, to solve. Okay. Now it gets a little bit even weirder because in that optimization problem, they actually have a um, sort of a time limit of 200 time steps. Maybe it's two, I think it's, yeah, I've got, time steps. I think it was uh, 0.02. So it's probably something like 10 seconds, I guess. Um, something like 10 seconds. Okay. Now that's another slightly weird thing. Like, of course, it makes sense to run your simulation for a certain amount of time and then stop it. Uh, but once you add a finite horizon, as opposed to an infinite horizon, that changes the optimal solution, right? the right thing to do is actually now time dependent. How can you see that? Well, if you're, if you're at time step 195, or let's say even 199, then actually you can do anything you want even when you're like, uh, pick a different color here. If I'm even up here, right? Since I've only got one time second step to go, right? I can mess around, I can, I can accelerate, whatever. There's just not enough time for me to ever violate that and lose and miss that reward, right? So in fact, as you get closer to the, to the time limit, so if, as time becomes like 195, 96, 97, then there's kind of a wall of, um, you know, the area of, I don't care what I do, creeps here and moves this way, right? Because I just don't have enough time to to go off into the into the bad area, and in general, when you have uh, any finite horizon uh, task, then the optimal strategy is time dependent. So to fit a controller that is time invariant to a cost function that is time dependent is again just a little 
weird, weird, right? So um, it's cer certainly you can search under the class of time invariant policies for the best policy that solves the finite horizon problem, but we just know that the optimal solution is different than that. Okay, so I think a, a you know a more elegant one, but a, a more numeric, you know, is mathematically more elegant, but maybe computationally more um, less convenient would be to have a discounted factor or something like that, or to try to solve the infinite horizon problem. Similarly, the, I mean, the other thing that happens in these, in both of those um, optimizations, the Acrobat and the cart pool, the actions are, um, are limited to only negative one, zero and positive one, not, the, anything between, it's not that they're railed at negative one and positive one. They are discreetly just, there's three choices for your action at every time step. And that's done, I think. Um, so we know that bang, bang control, that kind of gives you bang, bang control, right? We know that that is optimal in some cases, but actually, um, I, I mentioned it in, in the lecture, but it's actually very bad for, like this, this is good for an optimization algorithm because you can just check all those three actions and see what you get and, and pick the best one. It's very bad for a robot um, because motors don't actually go from full on to full off in a single time step. So that's always an abstraction. Um, and in particular, it, it's very hard to stabilize, let's say the acrobat at the top without having some continuous control there. That's a, you're always banging back and forth whatever your time discretization is, it's gonna to be too big and, and you're gonna have chatter and, and grossness there. So, um, you know, this is, this is something that I think uh, there's a tension between uh, the optimization algorithms and, um, and robots for sure. I, and I think some of, some of the um, baselines that we see in reinforcement learning today, they look like they're solving what I would consider to be robot tasks, but there's some assumptions made there that make it just kind of not, I, I think it's unfair to say that they are solving the real robot problem. Um, and then there are also tensions between what our algorithms work well for, our al algorithms and optimal control algorithms and you know handwritten algorithms are all have different things that they are their favorites. I think in a many cases, some of the benchmarks that get put out there tend to be the benchmarks that make the algorithms perform well and not the ones that are um, you know, destined for to, to be sort of like uh, most faithful to, to the real robot or anything like that. Does that make sense? That, did that point land? Yeah. So um, I have a question. Yeah, definitely. So um, in like, Regular deep learning, I guess using regularization is often a way of getting like a well-posed problem out of something that has too many free variables. So like here, I guess if you added a small reward for being at zero, u equals zero, you would, I, I think this like solves at least the time limit issue. Awesome question. Um, right. So like so in general, it seems like regularization might be like a way to address some of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. So, so that you know, regularization. If, if you're trying to regularize your your policy outputs, then choosing an objective that looks more like u squared, as opposed to um, having no cost on u, or I think which is this, what's happening here, or the um, yeah, I, I think the two ones we've looked at most, like the minimum time, there's no cost on u, but there's limits, and there's the quadratic. So I would say. Uh, yes, the quadratic cost on you feels a lot like regularization, like an L2 regularization in a supervised learning case. And I think it, it does take away the ambiguity. If there's nothing else required for the task, then you should command zero. So that would say any, anything inside there, you would command zero, you let the system behave however it would behave passively. And then when you hit the wall, the, that sorry, not, not the actual wall, but this, um, this region of inevitable, you know, I must take action. As soon as you hit there, then your policy would be to take the maximum action. Super good point. It's still kind of a weird way to balance in this particular case. Um, like, so, so the regularizing in state, if you think about LQR as being regularizing in state and action, I guess, would be a way to sort of uh, just be a different way to think about that.
What else? I guess sort of following up on that. So it seems like one of the, the differences, especially in the first case that you were indicating with that domain randomization is trying to solve is like, would it be accurate to say that something that's desirable about the handwritten solution feels like the fact that it's very, like in the case where what I'm thinking about is designing a symbolic controller, there, there is this like meta, what feels like some sort of meta objective function, which is on the like description length of the, of the controller. And it seems like there are certain approaches that people do take in implicit representations like neural networks to try and achieve that as well. Like there's, there's the kind of regularization we just described on the torque, but there's also like people will regular regularize the weights of the network or, um, like try to disentangle things and then crush them in other ways. Like, do you see that as a, essentially approximating what is made more explicit and, and that being a way to get around this? Because it feels like, right, domain randomization is this sort of like external way of controlling that, which seems very expensive to search over. <laughs> um, but it feels like maybe there's a more model-based, I mean, like it feels like in, in neural networks themselves, people who study those are trying to, or or like, remove the weights, drop out all these things. Like, do you see that as just approximating? I think it's this? awesome. Yes. So, so um, I would even say bigger, uh, so taking that to an extreme, I, I think there is an open big problem of how do you find a simple controller out of a deep learning kind of framework. And I think one approach is to regularize your weights, right? Um, I mean, I think what you'd really want there is something like an L1 regularization if you want sparsification. People often, will just put, um, well, they, they might not even regularize their weights, but they will they will train a network. They'll look for the weights that happen to be zero. You'll set them to zero and then you'll fine tune. That's another really important. And you can get big sparsification compression in that way. Um, I think the open question is, can you get, does, how far does that get you? Can you get it down? We've, we've been trying actually in, in, in uh, my group to see if you can push that all the way down to have networks that are um, controllers that are simple enough to be verified. For, that's that's one crit that's one sort of level of, a, of 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 achievement is if you can make a controller that is now amenable to closed loop verification, and and sparsification is a way to that. Um, yeah, it was. I liked your statement that that maybe Mark Spong was was optimizing. Uh, description length of his algorithm. I, I think he probably, there was also something about like what made the algebra work and uh, you know, what, what, what happened to work with energy functions and you know, things like that, right? It, it, it was more than description length, but I, I think you're, you're right on. Um, I guess my point is that it's been happening all along in very uh, subtle ways. And when we switched to optimization, we, we have to appreciate all those things that were happening the whole time. The way people build robots, like Mark, Mark Raybert, we're gonna talk about Raybert's hopping robots and, and even the way Spot is built today, for instance. Um, the, the legs on Spot are incredibly light and almost all of the dynamics of that legged robot, Spot is the quadruped from Boston Dynamics, sorry for talking in code, um, but, but the, the dynamics of the leg are incredibly light, okay? And that makes a lot of controllers very simple because they don't have to worry about the inertial effects of swinging the leg too fast, okay? That's just another way that engineers have somehow baked in simplicity into the controller, right? If you were to optimize the topology and mass parameters of your robot in optimization, if we, I don't know exactly what you'd have to ask for to get that out, but it's clearly a good idea. So I think it really does speak to the um, limitations of the way we're, or, or the challenges ahead of, of if we really are only going to program things to be a reward functions and objective functions, uh, you know, be careful what you, you might get what you ask for. So do people feel like they, they have a sense of for these canonical under actuated systems, right? 
So the I, I'm going to make sure I put the this up just in case anybody uh, slips out. And but I would I'd love to hear your feedback from this week. But um, so so where we're going next is so so someone asked on Piazza about Lyapunov functions. Awesome, I love that question. Um, we're going to spend uh, next week. We lose next Monday. It's a holiday, student holiday. On, so we we don't have lecture Tuesday because Monday is a holiday or whatever. Um, but, but next Thursday, we'll start on uh, understanding how to prove stability of some of these things. We saw a glimpse of it in the way that we derived the controllers for the Acrobat and the Carpole. But to make that a more general algorithmic approach, we're going to talk about what it means to prove stability in the general case and how to use algorithms to, to do that, to prove stability, correctness, you, you name it. Um, and then we're after that, so that will give us more confidence and more stronger tools that are can work in the continuous variables, no discretization problems for these types of systems. But then pretty quickly, in order to, we're gonna to try to make the systems more and more rich and more and more complicated and blow the stack on our current tools and see how far we can get output to walking robots and you name it, stochastic uh, and so on. So I will hang out and answer any questions, but that was, that was my, one point to make today. Must be Thursday. People are tired. Ready for the weekend. <laughs> weekend coming. Uh, forgive me if I completely missed something, but was the problem set supposed to be out yet? I just looked on the website and I can't see it. You haven't missed anything. We're rushing. We, we're, we're trying to get it out. We were absolutely okay. away from getting it out right before lecture. I think it, it, it will be out almost any minute. Cool. We're so very gonna close. Be the, that'll be the real test if I actually understood what happened this week. <laughs> All right, thanks. Sure. I had a question, but I can't remember what it was now. It was very early on. You should have asked right away. I know, I, I waited because I, 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 I was gonna see if anybody else was gonna ask stuff about it, but I don't remember what it was now. So I think you mentioned at some point in the lecture um, about like two different ways of like how to define the print, like the, the Acrobot, like there's two different like ways to do it. So how does that like affect the controller that like comes out of these sorts of things? Like, is there like advantages of like modeling it one way or the other? And like you, Acrobots like are relatively simple to think about, but if you think about like a, a robot or even like a quad rotor. Yeah. Is there like a way to like think about the best way to model the system for LQR or even like neural nets or something. Awesome. So let me be clear in the Acrobat example, the equations you get out with either choice should be identical in, in terms of floating point. The only question is, what is the I? Is it, is it okay. you would type in a different constant quantity for the inertial matrix mm -hmm. if you took it about the center of mass versus about the, um, the joint, the inbound joint. And therefore, you would need slightly different terms in order to make it all correct in the equations. But in terms of the controllers you would get out and everything, the system under test is exactly the same. So it, it shouldn't affect that. It could, could it affect your algebra? Possibly, but, but unlikely. I think they're, they basically just would just be canceling each other out. Okay, so it's not like the, the math. Okay, I guess that makes sense. But I was worried I mean, there that is like, a choice maybe... there. There's a choice there about choosing relative angles. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so um, I mean, that it's kind of the natural thing that would happen in, in a URDF or other things with that, that the elbow angle is relative to the other one. It's not an absolute angle. 
Mm -hmm. That would be one choice. And it could be that a different a system that looked simple in absolute coordinates looks harder in relative coordinates or vice versa. That, you know, you could, um, there are times where you actually want to, I mean, yeah, I think, I, I think the choice of coordinates is arbitrary and like how well the linearization works does depend on that choice of coordinates. And so it's actually, I think, very interesting to ask, uh, is there a better choice of coordinates where the linearization would be valid, valid for, for, for longer? Yeah, I guess that's kind of what I meant. Like, obviously all these things are equivalent, but like, I don't know, are, maybe there are ways that are just easier for these algorithms, which I guess just sort of comes out of intuition more than anything. No, I think you're right to expect more than that. Um, I think we, there's, there's, a, there's, that, there's a mathematical question there that we could attack. Um, yeah, I think in the specific case of the inertia, it would not manifest. It, the controllers would be the same. The linearization would be the same, but that's just that, was that particular example. But for instance, there's, a trig, there's, there's some trig identities you can play on the sine and cosines to make them all look into like a polynomial. For instance, instead of a, there's no trigonometrics, it's a polynomial, and you can linearize that coordinate system, and you will get a different controller that has a different region of attraction. Sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's smaller. I don't have a recipe or guarantee to yeah. say which one's better, um, except for to try solve both right now. Okay. But I do think, um, in fact, there's even I, I mentioned before, there's a limit where every system, if you increase the dimensionality. Every system can eventually be written as a linear system in higher dimensions. Mm -hmm. But how much are you willing to pay to go up there? Interesting. Cool. Thanks. Sorry for the long answer, the short question. No, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> I thought of something else, and I'm just curious if you have it, if you know if there's an answer to. Okay. Uh, when you're talking about spot, you know, that you consider massless legs, is, is there like a proper name for that? Is that called something? You're just regarding the body as basically being the only mass? I think the, the evolution of that, I mean, well, first of all, Raybert did it even in his hoppers. He had mm -hmm. um, big inertia, you know, big masses on the, on the arms of the, of the hopper, right? So it started early. Uh, I think the, I would connect it to the idea of centroidal models, right? The fact that people use center of mass type models uh, to do the control or whatever. And you, if you start thinking about what would it make to you know, slip the spring-loaded inverted pendulum or whatever to make those mathematical models more like what the real robot looks like and you end up with massless legs, right? Yeah, um, okay. So if I were to, yeah, I, I think centroidal dynamics is kind of the probably best buzzword for that general. Yeah, that it falls under that umbrella. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering, because when you said that, it made me think of, I, I don't know, for, you know, the cheetahs, we call it just the potato model. <laughs> the potato model. Sure there, yeah, because we just, uh, there, there are so many slides we have that it's the mini cheetah's legs, but attached to a potato. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've, I've actually heard that somewhere. I wonder if I heard it from Sangbe. Um, Andy Ruina used to say, assume a spherical cow. And then- Oh, they, yep, yep. And then he came back in one year, he's like, I was wrong. It should be a point cow. <laughs> a point cow. <laughs> there you go. So, so uh, it's all about getting it down to the essence. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually heard the assume a spherical cow, but in reference to uh, just in physics, or you know, just assume it's a sphere. I wonder. Yeah. I've always attributed it to Andy, but uh, yeah. And man, he might have, yeah, he might be the, the true source. I don't know. I, I bet there's a lot of weird intersectional, just, you know, passing of these kind of like pseudo terms. Cool. Well, it was a quiet day, but that's good. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.